Elijah Reed came down here right after the Civil War and he saw two things. He saw abundance of labor and abundance of resources. The bay was full of fish. So he moved his operation from Brooklyn, Maine down to the Chesapeake Bay and he established a plant down here named Taylor Reed. He moved his operation here and, and started the Menhaden business right here. Reedville has been the focus for Menhaden harvesting uh, from, from that point forward. Then other people started putting up factories. At one time there was many as 18 on the, on the creek. So it, it essentially built a town. Well, Elijah Reed came here, I think, in Lower Reedville in 1867, and they stayed in business till it was destroyed by far in 1925. You know, they were using the, the uh, fish for, for fertilizer. The fish produces three basic products, fish meal, fish oil, and fish solubles. And throughout history, the fish meal has been used for a number of, of applications, such as fertilizers, um, as well as animal feeds. Uh, the whaling industry was, was steadily going down because of overfishing, and they needed a, uh, a source of oil uh, for lighting lamps and industrial purposes, and Menhaden were a uh, outstanding renewable resource. John A. Haney, I know that we have records of 1884. Uh, he and his brother, Thomas Haney, um, started a factory they called Haney Snow. And then they, that they joined forces in 1913, uh, chartered as Reedville Oil and Guana Company. John A. Haney's son kind of took it over. And that was Raymond Lee Haney. He bought boats in the Gulf, bought fish plants in the Gulf. So that was really when they started really to spread out. Everything went out of business except Reedville Oil and Water Company and Standard Products Company. officer is tracing the path of the sub. Let's go, Tim, I don't remember them tying up any of the men in boats in World War II. There wasn't that many left. They were restricted where they could fish and when they could fish. Otherwise, if they went out to bay, they had certain codes for the signals they had to put up for them to come back in the bay. My grandfather was a fish boat captain out of Lewis, Delaware, and he was running down the coast back toward Delaware Bay, and it was nighttime, and a German U-boat came up right along beside him to, uh, he said, to refresh his air tanks and rode with him for uh, several miles before going back under, and he didn't see him anymore. I asked him if he had uh, reported it to the authorities. And he said no, he wasn't taking a chance on that and getting blown out of the water. You could uh, see the fires on the Liberty ships and things that the submarines were sinking. And you could see that, I don't know, we saw it several times. Well, when the war ended, they had hundreds and hundreds of these minesweepers uh, and landing barges. They went from the old wooden boats and to the minesweepers, but they were uh, World War II uh, wooden. And uh, they made a, a decent fish boat, nothing compared to what we're sitting on now. But, but they were fast, they had four engines in them. And then they started to use steel purse boats, which wasn't satisfactory, they were too heavy. They looked awfully dangerous because they didn't, you had hand pump to pump them out. They didn't have electric pumps. The freeboards were very low in the water, you know. And we even went and fished down Carolina and those things in the fall of the year. And I don't know why more people didn't get drowned, but... <laughs> right after the war, there was really a jump in technology. And one of the first ones was 
the fish pump that pumps the fish from the, from the steamer to the plant. The second thing that came by was they used nylon net. Cotton nets you had to, uh, every night after you got through working, you had to pickle them. I had to pull the net out on the house every night, salt it down, and then and then pump brine. I wish that was my job. Get up and pump brine on early in the morning before you know we start fishing. And then there was the uh, power block. Well, the Manhattan and Chandler is years ago you didn't have any power blocks to raise the fish. They were all done by muscle. And they sing chanters so they all be in harmony together. And then they all will pull at one time. And, and everything was done by hand power. Up until the late 1940s, the uh, Menhaden were spotted from the crow's nest on the steamers. And in the late 1940s, they started utilizing aircraft to go and locate the schools. But having no FM radios like we do now, they would come back with loudspeakers or voice hailers and tell them where the fish were. We will uh, get on the radio, on the FM radio, call the uh, captains and advise them where the fish are, how many are in the school, and how many schools we see. And the boats will come to that area to go to work. We have gone through a number of, of name changes. As our, as our markets changed, our names changed to reflect what, who we were marketing to. If we can get the uh, menhaden used for human consumption, it would definitely increase in value. Products that should be very healthy for the consumers, not just new and fun and exciting things to eat, but something very good for them to eat too. In the early 1980s, Omega Protein had a small 1950s vintage oil refinery in the Reedville fish plant and ran this process for a number of years, producing oils strictly for industrial applications like paints and varnishes. As consumer awareness began to increase of the knowledge of omega-3 fatty acids in human health, Omega Protein realized that we needed to have a, a food grade facility capable of producing products for human health. And a group of individuals saw the benefit of omega-3s long term and built the, the Health Science Center, which was state of the art um, and it still continues to be uh, one of the only oil refining complexes of its like in the, the United States. This facility was designed to house between 15 to 20 operators and it's fully automated. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids are extremely beneficial for cardiovascular health, for cognitive function, for brain and retina development of infants, for uh, behavioral disorders, uh, inflammation, and other health concerns. In the last five years, there have been an awful lot of improvements in the Reville plant. They've been focused on several different areas. We've reduced our air emissions by several orders of magnitude. We've eliminated water discharges. We've reduced our uh, groundwater withdrawal by more than 50%. In 2010, we initiated the use of our new DUPS dryer system, an airless dryer, uh, one of its kind in the United States. What that allowed us to do was to reduce or actually eliminate our air emissions from using old scrubbers where we used to dry our fish meal. We're now using that waste heat. We no longer use that fuel and no longer have that sulfur emissions in, into the atmosphere. It starts with people. It's going to continue to, to be built on employees that are smart and hardworking and that want to make the world a, a healthier place through nutrition. When you hire these uh, crews to go on these boats, all of a sudden it's like another family. If you get in a jam, you holler and somebody's going to come to you and help you. Because of the way that the company was set up in that it's, a, it's very much a business where um, generations of employees would you know, learn to fish on their dad's boat, 
become a boat captain themselves and then have the son that would work on a boat. That, had, that instilled a certain amount of forward thinking in the employees, which I, don't, I think is unique to probably any other company that's out there. My family's been fishermen here on this very site uh, for almost 100 years. My great-grandfather was a captain for Reville and Guano in the early 1900s. My grandfather was a captain here. My father was a captain here, as well as were his three brothers. But my dad's still here. He's been here like close to 50 years. I bet. Of course, the three sons are the captains of boats down there, and three grandsons are the working on the boats down there. It wasn't about what do we do next fishing season, it was really about what do we do 20 fishing seasons out so that you know, the company is stronger for my family and my neighbors. You know, people like myself and the, the generations that follow will always realize the importance of investing in the future. Omega Protein has operations in the Gulf of Mexico where we have three plants, one in Cameron, Louisiana, one in Abbeville, Louisiana, and one in Moss Point, Mississippi. Our fishery, both here on the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, is certified by Friend of the Sea, which is an international organization that verifies the sustainability of various fisheries. The Menhaden fishery is one of the cleanest fisheries in the world, and its bycatch has been deemed insignificant by the National Marine Fishery Service. The company long term is going to be a company based on the nutritional value that we bring to the world. The acquisitions that we've made over the last two to three years are important because of the way that it rounds out the vertical integration that the company is looking for. From the time that that, that fish is caught to the time that that oil ends up in a soft gel, we've had control of the process for the entire time and someone can feel comfortable giving that, that supplement to, uh, to a loved one. One of the things I'm most proud of since I got here at, at this Reveal plan is the openness that we now have with the community. Uh, we are engaging uh, both our local politicians as well as the citizens in the community, allowing to, them to come into the plant, uh, showing them what we do, uh, explaining to them the importance both economically and socially that this plant has to, to this area as well as the state. And I think that has greatly improved our, our community uh, perspective and, and, and what people think of this plant.